Hey everyone, welcome back to Data Science One. Uh, today we're going to be talking about model building. Uh, this is a, a particular part of data science that, that I am uh, especially fond of, uh, given that my own research is in machine learning. Um, so how this fits into the, the larger scope of our class um, is that uh, you know we've, we've talked about uh, collecting data, um, and, and doing some cleaning to get uh, data that we can work with. So now we're, we're really going to start in uh, on transitioning from, from understanding the data to building a model that, that helps us understand the world, uh, which, which I think is, is obviously a, a really exciting part of this process. Uh, so we're going to start uh, with some pretty basic uh, high-level introductions, and, and I hope that most of this seems pretty simple and straightforward. Um, and it is familiar of things that you've seen before, uh, since we're going to start with, with simple linear regression, um, of which I'm, I'm sure all of you are familiar. So uh, the, the purpose of today is, is really just to formalize some of these ideas uh, so that we can take something that, that we're already familiar with and, and know quite well and, and build an understanding of modeling more generally uh, so that when we transition to more and more complex models, uh, all of that, that will fall into place with, with your current understanding. So to, to start really vaguely uh, or really abstractly uh, about what a, what a model is, uh, so a model is a, an idealized representation of a system. Um, so both uh, both representation and idealized are are, are both uh, important uh, concepts here. Um, the the idea that it's a, a representation means that you're capturing. Um, some part of the, the data that you're interested in or the process, the system that you're interested in. Um, but of course, being idealized means that, that we're not capturing all of um, all of the complexity or all of the components of that original system. Um, to, to quote one of the, the um, most prominent uh, statisticians of the, the 20th century, George Box, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, we're, we're never going to build a model that, uh, that exactly captures everything that's happening in the real world. That's just not practical um, and, and frankly not very useful because uh, if, if you were to do that, you could just use the actual real world. It would be uh, uh, just as easy and in fact probably easier than building a model that complex. Um, but, but some are useful, which is to say if we've captured the important parts of the dynamic uh, of the system we're studying, then we can uh, we can use that our model to say something about that dynamic or or that part of the system. Um, to to bring in uh, another uh, famous quote, uh, everything should be made as simple as possible, but but no simpler, which is uh, exactly the case with models. Um, that we want uh, to to capture everything that's important about the phenomenon we care about, but nothing about the system that doesn't relate to our particular phenomenon. So why do we build models? Uh, we, we build models for a, a number of reasons. Um, to, to break them down into to two broad classes, one is to increase our understanding uh, of the systems that we're modeling. Um, so, so this is uh, uh, closer to what we've talked about before in terms of uh, inference, where we're trying to say something about our population from our sample, something about the, the real world from uh, the, the little slice of data that, that we've collected. And so you can think of lots of uh, models. Uh, for example, uh, the, the first bullet point on, uh, on modeling uh, the spread of COVID uh, might be a, a network-based or agent-based model. Um, the, the second uh, bullet uh, asking about uh, an object's velocity and acceleration might be a, a physics-based model. Um, and, and these models uh, try and capture and reproduce uh, some very simple and very interpretable uh, a toy version of, of some phenomenon that's going on in the real world. Uh, another reason that we might want to model is to make predictions about the data. So, so before we uh, we said uh, that uh, predictions are, are about uh, being able to say something about future samples, where inference is more about uh, understanding your your original population or, or the the world as a whole. Um, so these predictions are saying if we were to get new data in the future, uh, what what could we say about uh, about that new sample of data? So, for example, if uh, you looked at lots of um, CT scans or X-rays, um, if you were to see a new one in the future, could you predict whether or not a patient had lung cancer? Or uh, 
for a, a business, uh, you know, given lots of uh, features of your customer base or your marketing for that year or, or what have you, can you predict the, the sales? Um, the, these are uh, first classification, yes, no uh, questions, and then, then regression, real valued questions. Um, but models don't, don't have to have that simple of an answer. For example, the, the last bullet point uh, says, uh, can we uh, build a model that generates a, a summary of a 10 page long article? That's, that's still a, a model that takes in an input and, and spits out an output. Um, it's just that the output uh, is a, a complex data structure in itself. Um, some some real uh, real world text um, uh, rather than than just a, a single scalar value as, as you might get for the the first two examples. So in these types of predictive models, what we really care about is is often accuracy um, because it, it really matters uh, if uh, a patient comes in and and you can say whether or not they actually have lung cancer. Uh, the the accuracy of that prediction. Um, potentially uh, outweighs the uh, the understanding that we gain about lung cancer um, if we were to, to create some physics-based model about the, uh, the the processes within a lung. But but that's not to say that one of these is, is necessarily any more important than the other. It depends on the question um, and, and depends on uh, what we're going to use our model for. Um, for example, in, in that case of lung cancer screening, uh, suppose that, uh, that we were using this model to uh, inform uh, a clinician decision rather than making a, making a, a, a specific recommendation um, from the model itself. Maybe then understanding what features the model was looking at would help clinicians to better uh, search for, for those features in their data. Um, or, or it could be the case that we have regulatory oversight, that the, the FDA won't approve a model unless we can say something about, um, about why it's making its predictions uh, to make sure that, that these make sense uh, and that they're, they're not uh, making, um, making the ju judgments based off of some particularities of the data set that they're trained on uh, or some features that, that are you know, unfair or, or biased um, based off of, of other populations that we could apply this model to. Um, so, so both the, the interpretability and accuracy are, uh, uh, can be uh, very important, and, and often there's a, a trade-off between the two, that, uh, that simple models are often more interpretable, but complex models often perform better. Um, so uh, again, uh, it totally depends on your particular instance, uh, how, how you fall on this spectrum. Uh, this is just to, to say that uh, uh, if we have very complex models, uh, that take in uh, uh, structured data like images, and we can uh, then make uh, really critical and, and important uh, uh, outcome decisions from, from those models. Um, we, we won't be uh, looking at this particular example in, in this class, um, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll still be using some, uh, some real world examples. So to orient you a little bit more, um, let's talk about, uh, about some uh, quick notation. Um, so, uh, the, the notation here uh, in, in some cases will be very similar to what you've seen before and in some cases will be subtly different. Um, for our outcome variables, we're going to use uh, the standard Y. Um, our, our plain Y uh, is the, the true observations, um, what, what those outcomes actually look like in our data or in the real world. Uh, y hat will be what we think the uh, observations should be. Uh, which is to say what the, the outputs of our model are for any uh, given input data. Uh, the x, is, uh, x variable uh, will be our input features to the model. So the, the features uh, like we've seen so far uh, for, for our uh, variable columns in our data frames uh, are the, the things that we think are important about the real world. When we talk about uh, modeling things that, that are as simple as possible, um, one of the ways a model is simple is that it only considers a, a small number of features um, that, that we input into our particular model. Um, and then the, the last uh, uh, character that we'll introduce is, uh, is theta, uh, which are the parameters of our model. Um, so, uh, so this is, uh, is uh, how we try to uh, take the inputs and, and turn them into outputs that, that make sense. And, and we're trying to 
uh, to estimate uh, or, or to train or to fit uh, these parameters such that uh, they do the best job of making our predicted observations similar to our real world observations. And we'll, we'll formalize all of that in, in a couple slides. Um, but uh, but the parameters of our model, uh, which is to say uh, how many or what type of uh, of parameters we fit, are another way that, that we might measure the complexity of our model um, and, and think about its its simplicity versus um, its uh, expressiveness. So uh, thinking about very simple models, uh, maybe the the simplest model of all would would just be a, a constant value, one that that doesn't consider your input at all. Uh, we'll, we'll show an example of that in, in the next slide. Um, but this is a generalization of, uh, of a model that could consider um, some parameters, but, but also the inputs uh, when deciding uh, what, uh, what we're going to predict for the output variables, um, often written as uh, f of x and theta equals y hat, uh, sometimes also written with the, the theta as a, a subscript. Uh, so it's f subscript theta. Um, uh, of x, um, depending on, on which subfield uh, you you uh, uh, subscribe to. Uh, the, the parameters uh, are, are what define our model, um, and, and in the, the case of the constant model, uh, the, this is the, the simplest set of parameters you could possibly have, just a, a single scalar value. Um, but throughout the semester, we'll consider uh, more and more complex models. Uh, later in, in this lecture, we'll, we'll consider a, a linear model, uh, which, uh, as you see here, uh, y equals uh, theta 0 plus theta 1 times x uh, has, has two parameters and also considers, uh, in this case, a, a scalar input, um, input variable uh, in our model. Uh, and, and of course, uh, what we're trying to do is, is train these parameters. So uh, an example of a, a constant model uh, is uh, might be from your textbook here. Uh, we're trying to predict the uh, the amount of tip that a person uh, might might give at a restaurant. Um, and looking at the the data, doing some exploratory data analysis, uh, we can see uh, a, a, a clustering towards the middle uh, of this distribution here, uh, somewhere in the the twelve to twenty percent range. Uh, maybe 14, maybe 15 percent, um, but it's if if we're looking at a, a constant value, that's to say that there, there, there we're, we're predicting one single instance um, in uh, in this histogram. It would be a, a vertical line would 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 be our model, uh, which is to say it's it's only at a single tip amount, um, and, and so this raises the question. Um, of if you were to prescribe a model, uh, let's say uh, a tip of 15%, um, how, how could you measure that? Um, how could you measure exactly how good that model is? Um, and, and this will play into uh, how we talk about uh, fitting our models. Um, I, I could also note here that, uh, that an alternative to uh, this statistical-based modeling approach that, that we've been talking about so far, uh, getting getting more towards the uh, the first type of models we introduced, um, that, that are, are more uh, uh, physics-based or or expert systems-based, uh, would be to say that you know we uh, rather than looking at the data, we might suspect that uh, uh, round amounts uh, tend to be given more. Um, and that uh, a standard amount like 15% or 20% uh, might be the, uh, the most likely tip amount. Um, and, and you can see that uh, the, the histogram here certainly, um, certainly uh, uh, backs that hypothesis. Uh, but digging into the statistics and, and building a statistical model, uh, we, we can be a little bit more precise about that. So uh, just to uh, reinforce one, uh, one more a piece of terminology you've mentioned so far. Uh, when we're looking at the prediction, this is to, to take a, a given model uh, and ask for uh, an output what, or for an input what its output would be. Um, and this is, is very much related, but different from the task of, of estimation, which we also call fitting or training a model, um, which is to determine the, the ideal values of its parameters theta. So, uh, so this question of how we choose the, the right values theta um, and, and how we measure how good a, a model is or not uh, is through a, a loss function. 
Uh, so this is uh, simply a, a mathematical function that tells us how good or bad our predictions are. Um, and what, what we typically try to do is minimize the loss, uh, which is to say how far away the predicted value is from our actual value. Seems to, to make sense. Um, and, and again, very intuitively, uh, the, the measurement for this is simply the error of our model, or y minus y hat. Um, for a, a particular data point, uh, we can uh, put in a, a subscript of, of i for, for saying that we'll look at the error of data point i, um, in which case uh, y sub i minus uh, y uh, hat sub i is our error for data point i. So this is, uh, is very straightforward and intuitive, uh, but, uh, but has some issues. Uh, so for example, um, the uh, the loss that we get if we were to uh, put in a, a number that's above or below our true value. So let's uh, let's suggest that uh, maybe fifteen percent was the the true um, the true average tip amount. Um, if if you were to guess sixteen or fourteen, you would be the same amount away, uh, but you would get different values for your your loss function. Um, so uh, th there are uh, a handful of simple ways to, to fix this. Uh, the, the most common is just to square your error term. Uh, this is nice because obviously squared, uh, squared functions have a, a domain strictly above zero, meaning that you can't uh, get a negative number um, from your squared loss. Um, so now the, uh, the squared value of your errors for 14 or 16, uh, assuming that your true value is 15, is exactly the same. Both of those have a, a squared loss of one um, for, for that data point. Um, and, and again, we'll, we'll do that for each data point. Um, uh, another way to end up with a, a loss function that, that has the same feature of not going negative is, is to use an absolute value function. Um, we'll, we'll call this a, an L1 loss because it's a, a first order, uh, where the squared loss is a, a second order term, so we'll call it a, an L2 loss. Uh, one of the, the nice features about both of these is that uh, the minimum loss uh, is, is zero, uh, since uh, the, the domain of these functions, uh, sorry, the, the range of these functions can never go below zero. Um, and so, uh, so we, we have a, a nice knowledge of what our minimum loss is, uh, but we also know that our minimum loss occurs when we have the, the correct uh, prediction or, or the correct model parameters. Uh, to, to measure this loss, um, we will look at, at all of the, the losses of, of all of the data points in our, our data set, um, and, and we'll average them. Uh, this is uh, typically called the, the average loss. Um, and and uh, again, this is general for any loss function. Um, it, it tells us how well uh, our data is fit. Uh, or how good of a job our parameters are doing at producing the, the correct outputs. Uh, when we uh, apply this to some of the specific uh, error or loss function that we've talked about, like the, the mean squared error or the, the L2 loss, um, the, those terms are, are used pretty interchangeably, um, then, uh, then what we get is the, the mean squared error, uh, which is, uh, is to say uh, this is the, the mean of the squared errors. Um, quite quite simply, um, and, and by extension, you can uh, imagine the the mean absolute error, which is the the average of the absolute error um, absolute error values. Uh, so so both of these uh, are are nice um, in that they they have the the property um, of uh, of being uh, strictly uh, above zero. Um, the mean squared error has a, a nice extra property in that the since you're squaring the error terms, the farther and farther away you get from the true value, you're penalized exponentially more. Um, and, and this uh, incentivizes uh, single value, single predictions that are very, very wrong, which is something you typically want to avoid in a model. Um, the absolute error uh, doesn't uh, more harshly predict errors that are very wrong, uh, but it does have the nice feature of being a, a little bit more interpretable. Um, that uh, that to, to say um, 
your squared error is some amount, uh, it doesn't necessarily make sense, but if you're looking at the absolute error, then uh, then it, it does make sense to say that if your true value was 15 and you guessed 20, that you're five percentage points away. Um, so this is, is in the same units as our, uh, as our predicted uh, variable y. So uh, much like we, we use standard deviation uh, in a previous lecture uh, to get uh, back to the original units, we can do that same thing with our, our mean squared error and take the, the square root of it. Uh, so the, the root mean squared error is, uh, is similarly a, a, popular, um, a popular loss function. Uh, it's uh, slightly more interpretable than the, the mean squared error, um, though in, in machine learning context, the mean squared error um, by itself is, is still a, a little bit more popular. Um, but, uh, but the root mean squared error, um, when you have to interpret the errors uh, manually, um, it, uh, it, it makes a, a little bit more intuitive sense. In, in all of these cases, though, uh, the, the actual values of the error um, aren't aren't nearly as important as comparisons between uh, between two sets of parameters or between two models um, on, on the same loss function. Um, so so you can uh, uh, you can uh, take any of these loss functions, even if you can't interpret them directly, uh, and and say uh, whether a certain set of parameters is is better or worse. Uh, I also want to point out that uh, that we've uh, talked about a, a few different parts of the modeling process so far, um, and, and that these, well, while certainly related, are are completely interchangeable um, uh, and, and separate from each other. So, for example, uh, you could have a, a model that's a constant model, like we talked about, or or a linear model. And for, for either choice of that, you could use uh, a root mean squared error loss function, uh, an absolute squared error loss function, uh, or sorry, a, a mean absolute error loss function. Um, and, and either of those loss functions would apply to either of those models. Uh, similarly, uh, there are lots of different ways to fit a model. Um, and it, often uh, the, the uh, approach that you'll take to fit a model um, can depend on which model you choose, but even for a given model, there are multiple um, alternate ways that, that you could go uh, about fitting one. Uh, we will not talk about fitting a model in, uh, in detail uh, within the, the scope of this class, um, but uh, it's a, a topic that, that I personally think is, is really interesting, and I, I hope that you learn more about it in your uh, machine learning class. Um, for, for now, we'll just say that uh, in general, we'll fit these models through uh, an iterative process uh, that, uh, that sets, the, um, sets a, an initial value for the parameters, uh, takes, uh, makes some predictions based off of some inputs, um, and then tries to uh, adjust the models so that they're slightly better. Um, and, and does this uh, again and again and again. Um, and there, there's lots of uh, approaches to, to do this iteratively. The most popular one is, is stochastic gradient descent, or, or SGD. Um, uh, but uh, but it, it completely depends. So for example, uh, for our uh, uh, linear regression models, we actually won't use an iterative approach. We'll, uh, we'll just use some, uh, some matrix solves that, uh, that just rely on a little bit of clever linear algebra. Uh, but again, all of that is outside of the, the scope of what we're going to talk about here. So when we're uh, fitting models, uh, one of the things that, that we care about um, is how well these models are fit. That's exactly what we're trying to measure with our loss functions. Um, and, and we can imagine different types of, of fits. Uh, and, and this relates to the idea of models being as, as simple as, uh, as possible, but no simpler. Um, so the, the model that's, that's too simple, um, for example, considering that everyone leaves the same tip uh, at a restaurant regardless of, of anything else uh, about their personality or about their meal, uh, probably doesn't account for enough variation within, uh, within people. Um, which is to say that this might be uh, most like the, the left plot here of an underfit model. Um, where you're, you're capturing some of the trend, but there, there's clearly other aspects of this trend uh, that, that aren't captured in your model. 
uh, looking at the, the middle pane, uh, a model that, that does capture some of the the other uh, large scale trends going on in your data might be uh, might be fairly well fit. Um, but uh, on the, the right side, we can imagine uh, a model that's that's highly overfit, uh, which is to say that uh, that we fit not only the, the trends that are happening in our data, but also the noise. Uh, you, you, what uh, what you can see if you uh, just look at uh, at these trend lines is that there, there appear to be a, a main direction that we're going, um, but but with you know lots of random noise around that in the overfit model. Um, clearly is is trying to uh to model uh the the noise within that data and you can tell just by looking at the the curve or especially the the slopes of the curve um that the the uh the process that a model is is fitting um is uh, is is one that uh, is is very different from the the underlying trend within a, a data set um and i know this is a, a little confusing now but uh but let's ask uh a little bit more formally how we can uh, how we can uh, uh, categorize and, and quantify uh, these underfit well-fit or overfit models in the, the next few slides so uh, so asking about why overfitting is bad uh, overfitting is bad because if if we build a model that uh, that fits uh, exactly the error in our data set uh, sorry, exactly the noise in our data set. Uh, likely, uh, our, uh, our, the data that we'll actually end up applying this model to uh, may have the same underlying trends, but, but certainly we'll have different noise uh, kind of by the definition of, of noise. Um, and, and so if we, um, if we, we fit a model uh, to the, the noise of the data, um, then, then it actually will, will do fairly poorly in uh, in generalizing to other data um, that, that has different noise instances or, or to say that's not in the sample that we took to train our model in so so how can we measure this uh, in particularly uh, in particular um, what we'll, we'll do is we'll uh, take some data uh, that, uh, that that we have and, and pretend that we don't have it so we'll, we'll train our model uh, just on part of our data, and then uh, and then ask uh, how well it generalizes to to new random samples that that aren't the ones that uh, that this model was trained on. Um, now we'll we'll often have to do this where we we pretend to hold out uh, or we, we pretend we don't have data that we do, um, because often you won't have real answers to uh, to the actual data. Um, that uh, that you'll see in the real world if if you were to just uh, to to take this model and apply it to some system, um, if if we have a, a lung cancer screening model, um, we don't actually know for for folks who who come into the the clinic whether or not they they have lung cancer or they don't, um, and and so it's it we we won't know how well uh, how well we're we're generalizing to to real world data. So to be be slightly more uh, explicit about this, uh, if we we take our uh, original data set um, of which we we have inputs in, and we also have uh, the known outputs for all of the instances in this data set, um, what we uh, what we could do is we could hold out some amount of this data um, as as test data and and train our model uh, just on uh, on some subset, let's say eighty percent of the data. Uh, again, training uh, is, is the, the fitting process here where we take our parameters um, and, and try to minimize the, the loss. Um, so, uh, so given this training data, um, we will then uh, test that data. So ask for the predictions on our, uh, on our uh, held out test set. Um, and we can use the same uh, error or loss function that we've talked about to look at the difference uh, between the predicted and actual values for our training set and our test set, because both of these we have the actual outputs for. Um, and so this is, is a way that, that we can say how well our data generalizes, or how well our model generalizes to data it's never seen before. Now, uh, there's a, a few wrinkles that we can put into this procedure. So for example, uh, it, we could uh, we could think of splitting into a training set, a validation set, and a, a test set. So so why would we want to do this? Um, 
maybe uh, it's important to to think about how our generalization error uh, is is tracking over the course of training. Um, and it would be cheating if we were to take our, our test data, our kind of gold standard tests at the end, uh, and use that information to help us determine things in training, um, like uh, hyperparameters. So, so, so those of you who've, who've taken machine learning, uh, hyperparameters are, are extra things about, uh, about your model or about your, uh, your training optimizer, um, besides just the, the parameters of your actual model theta. Um, or it, we could be uh, we could be using our uh, our validation set um, to say uh, when we uh, when we should stop training um, when we think that we're we're overfitting to our data um, and uh, and and uh, be and uh, making that distinction based off of our test data would be using information from the test to to help our learning which which would very much be cheating. Uh, there are lots of flavors of, of validation. One of the, uh, the, the most commonly used is, is cross-validation. So this idea uh, is that uh, rather than doing uh, one training and validation split, um, we'll actually do many training and validation splits. Um, this is, is nice um, if, we, uh, if we have a, a particularly small data set, uh, it lets us use uh, use the, our, our whole training and validation set to, to help build the model um, because often our, our main limitation uh, in, in model building will be our the amount of data that we have. Um, so anytime we're, we're pulling out subsets like these, these test or validation sets, uh, that's uh, reducing the amount of data our model has to train on. Um, and the, the way that the cross-validation works is that instead of uh, taking one set of, let's say, 80% of your data and training on it, uh, and another of 20% of, of your data and validating on it, um, we would, uh, we would uh, uh, take out, uh, we'd split our data into, into five sections, or, or in this, this example, 10 sections if the, the validation set is 10% is of our data. Um, and, and for each of those splits, we would train a model uh, that uh, that train that is fit to all of the data except for the the one batch that we're validating on, um, and train the model on the the remaining and ask for the validation accuracy, and, and do this uh, for each of the the different um, the different validation folds uh, of which there are, are k of them, um, and then take the the average uh, validation error or validation accuracy or validation loss um, as, as the metric uh, for our, our whole data set. Uh, so this is nice in that uh, it, it adds a, a little bit of robustness to uh, particular samples because each of the samples we train our model on is, is slightly different. Um, and, and it helps uh, us use the, the full training size because there's, there's never a set that we take out and, and throw away. What's used for the validation set in one fold is, is used for training in, in all the other folds. Um, so this, this cross-validation uh, process is a, a nice way um, to, to incorporate your validation set into to your training set. Um, it, it's also possible to do this cross-validation technique um, with, uh, with k-fold uh, cross-validation on your, your test data. Um, similarly, uh, if, if you're, uh, you're particularly uh, data starved in an application, this is a, a nice way, again, to uh, kind of boost the uh, the effective size of your training set, um, even if it comes at the the cost of more computation because you're you're training separate models for each of these these k folds before you average their performance. Um, and, and so uh, what we end up with for any of these models is uh, is uh, not just a single error value or a single loss, but we have different values for the the loss on our training set or the loss on our testing set. Uh, or the loss on our, our validation set. Um, and, and each of these will, will tell us different things about our data. Um, so, so in particular, bringing this back home to the, the question of overfitting, um, if, we, uh, if we have uh, an underfit model that we're not capturing any of the main trends, uh, we're going to have a pretty poor training error. Um, and, and probably, if, if that's the case, uh, we, we might not even try testing because if, if you can't fit the data that you have, what, what are the chances you're going to generalize uh, to data you've never seen? 
Um, but but either way, the the generalization accuracy would would tend to be quite poor as well. Uh, if you if you pulled other examples um, from this this trend, um, a, a well fit model will have pretty decent training error and and pretty decent uh, validation and test error. This is uh, obviously what we're hoping for. Uh, an overfit model though uh, will have like exceptionally good training error um, because uh, uh, unlike the well fit model, uh, we're we're actually going to be perfectly or near perfectly capturing all of the variation within our training data. Um, but of course, when we uh, think about uh, adding in more uh, random dots along this curve, or, or which is to say uh, held out data in our test set or in our validation set, uh, we're, we're going to do pretty poorly um, because, uh, because the model that we fit is, is to the noise of our training data. Uh, so, so looking at the difference between train error and validation error uh, or test error is a good way to, to know when overfitting has happened. Um, and, and just as a, a side note, through these iterative processes of, of model training, uh, we'll, we'll start uh, with underfit models and, and our models will, will be fit better and better to our training data as we, um, as we iterate through training. Um, so, so one of the ways to prevent overfitting is to, to be continually looking at your training error and your validation error. Um, and your, your training error will, will hopefully uh, kind of always be going up, uh, but, but at some point your validation error uh, will, will go up as you capture the, the trends in the data, but then start to fall again uh, as you, you start overfitting to the noise. Um, and, and when that happens, that's a, a good, one good way of knowing uh, to, to cut off your training and, and stop because you have a well-fit model and, and you're starting to overfit. Um, again, that's, that's beyond the scope of what we want to talk about here for linear regression, but uh, it, it's, it's certainly related to these plots, so, so I thought uh, I should, should mention it here. Uh, so, so let's talk about specifically linear regression. Uh, so uh, this uh, will, will I, I think, be, uh, be quite a bit of review and, and quite simple. Um, that, that you've uh, you know probably known of, of linear regression models since uh, since middle school, um, and uh, and and obviously we've worked with them already in our in our assignments. Um, so uh, as we mentioned before, uh, we're we're gonna be looking uh, in in these scatter plots uh, for relationships between two variables. Um, and we can think of all sorts of relationships, uh, you know, random noise, very strong linear relationships, nonlinear relationships, um, and, uh, and the, the way that we've talked about uh, previously uh, measuring these is, is by uh, the, the correlation coefficient between the two um, that, that you've learned about uh, previously and also in, in basic stats. Um, so to, to connect this with, uh, with our linear models. Um, the the correlation coefficient uh, is is asking uh, how well the the uh, rise versus run of of these models uh, fit each other, which is to say how much the um, the uh, addition of uh, your x variable um, increases or decreases your y variable with a, a positive or, or negative uh, correlation coefficient, uh, which is exactly related to the, the slope of a, a linear model. Um, so, so hopefully uh, you remember that uh, a linear model is, is just one uh, that has two parameters, uh, a fixed constant value and, uh, and a, a value that depends on, on your input parameter. Uh, for simplicity here, we'll consider the, the output y hat and the input x to be just scalar values. Um, but uh, but you can imagine uh, the, these being you know vectors as well. Um, for uh, for simplicity's sake, uh, often uh, theta zero and theta one in linear regression models are, are given the the uh, names uh, a and b for the variables. Uh, when you first learned about these, you you might have uh, had the x uh, be associated with the, the first parameter, so you you might have learned ax plus b. Um, to be a little bit more uh, machine learning-y, uh, we're going to uh, uh, write our models in a, a polynomial form such that, that each term is, is in, uh, with increasing order. So, uh, so A not being dependent on X at all is, is order zero, and B uh, being multiplied by X is order one, 
uh, if you were to have uh, you know a, a plus c times x squared term in a, in a quadratic function that would be an order two term um, and we'll write those in in increasing order here um, so yeah the the y hat equals a plus bx is our sim simple linear regression model um, the the uh, equation uh, of a linear regression model we can extrapolate to multiple linear regression as well um, so uh, so uh, I, I just mentioned going to to more and more complex models adding in higher order terms um, but we can also add in as many terms uh, that, that are linear as we want and, and it will still be considered a, a linear regression model um, so uh, so for example uh, we could consider um, in the the prediction model for a tip um, not just uh, uh, a constant value of a, a tip that the, the person would always give, but maybe a, a factor of uh, how expensive the, the meal was, and then maybe a, another feature that says uh, what time of day it was, um, and uh, maybe a, a third on the, the gender of the, the server. Um, and and uh, each of these things uh, will be simple, uh, have a simple linear relationship with our output variable, uh, in this model, but but we can uh, we can consider the cumulative effect of of lots and lots of different um, different input features. Um, yet, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is a still a, a first order model since none of those features uh, contain higher order uh, exponential terms. Now the the fitting of these linear models and, and how we'll build them, uh, as well as how we'll, we'll do a lot of the, the machine learning uh, type operations like uh, creating uh, train test splits um, or, or, uh, or defining our error or loss functions. Um, in, in this class will happen uh, primarily through the, the Python package scikit-learn. Um, so I, I encourage you guys to, to read up uh, on the documentation here. Uh, like, like all the other packages we've used, uh, this is a really popular and really well-documented one. Um, and you'll be, uh, be seeing some of this in your uh, assignment this week, too. Uh, so uh, given that we've uh, kind of wrapped up all the messy details of actually uh, fitting these models into the back end of, of scikit-learn, um, and, and kind of ignore them for now. Um, we can uh, go straight from uh, having uh, defining our linear model into having one that's fit. So if, if we have a model that's fit, um, we can can move on uh, to towards the the last stage of the the data science uh, pipeline, which is to say uh, interpreting and, and sharing the results of of our model. So uh, we, with a, a linear model. Uh, the interpretation is is fairly straightforward, but we should mention some caveats. Um, so uh, obviously, the the two parameters here are our uh, y-intercept and our slope. Um, the the slope is typically the one that's that's uh, 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 most useful or or, mo or often most important, um, which is to say, this is how one variable is associated with or changes with the other. Um, and and uh, and we can you know imagine lots of examples here uh, height versus weight um, as as being a relationship between two variables that that we can find out with our uh, linear regression model uh, much much the way we could with a, a correlation coefficient um, the uh, the units uh, of slope uh, are are the uh, division of the units of each of our variables um, as you you probably remember from from basic stats as well. Uh, so one thing to, to be careful of here is uh, is to not uh, imply uh, causation from from correlation in these models. That uh, just because uh, two uh, two variables are associated doesn't mean that that um, there's a, a causal relationship. So uh, put more simply, uh, if uh, if we have a model here that uh, says that uh, uh, the output variable height uh, is positively associated with weight. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that if someone in the data set were to gain weight, they would also gain height. Um, what it does mean is that across many different people of different weights, the ones who are heavier tend to be taller. Um, so this is, is patterns across, um, uh, across uh, a, a snapshot in time, 
um, and, and not necessarily uh, uh, causations that would lead us to, to say how uh, we might make changes to any particular uh, one of our data points, uh, which is a, a trap that, that's very easy to fall in um, when you hear that, um, that uh, you know, for example, um, drinking coffee is, uh, is associated with uh, having less cancer that uh, you might think, oh, well, I, I should start drinking coffee now. Um, but uh, as we talked about earlier in the semester, that's uh, clearly the case of, uh, of an association and, and not necessarily uh, the, the case of a, a causal link. Um, and, and, and like I said, this is, uh, this is uh, about uh, the differences between uh, there are the patterns between different data points within, within our data set. Uh, when we have uh, multiple features uh, in our, our multiple uh, linear regression models, uh, one of the, the other nice things we can do is to, to rank the importance of these uh, features. Um, so, uh, so here, rather than, than height versus weight, um, this is uh, looking at uh, uh, lots of features of, uh, in this case, uh, uh, an infant's uh, size uh, and, and trying to predict their weight. So. Uh, so here uh, you can see that each of the different uh, different linear uh, input features have different uh, weights or, or different parameter values, different slopes associated with them. Um, and from those slopes, you can tell uh, across the population, again, how much uh, uh, an additional unit of, of that variable changes the output. Um, so in this case, since uh, the, the femur length of the, the, the infant has, um, uh, sorry, of, of the, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the femur length has the, the most, uh, the, the most, uh, uh, the highest association, the, the most correlation um, with the, the output variable. Um, and so we, we could say that in our model, uh, this is the, the most important feature uh, of, uh, of all the ones shown here. Uh, the uh, the the way that we rank these features uh, typically is is by the absolute value of their uh, of their uh, coefficients, um, which is to say that uh, that we think of features having a, a strong influence on the output, whether that influence is, is positive or negative. Um, but uh, there are some cases where you where you do care about uh, you very much care about what direction. Um, the associations are if they're a positive or a negative association, um, and so so you might break down the uh, the the ranking of um, of your input features uh, to to differentiate between uh, um, between features that, that increase or decrease your output variable. Uh, one uh, one final point about uh, about uh, this model fitting and, and generalization. Uh, as a whole is that uh, we're, we're talking a lot about um, two data sets. And in the case where, where we take our one data set and randomly pull out you know, 90% for training and 10% for testing, uh, we're pretty confident that because we had a, a large sampling frame to begin with and, and took a simple random sample from that, um, that we have two distributions that are uh, identical. Um, which is to say from the, the same original uh, process and, and that the, each of the, um, each of the uh, uh, data points are, are independent from each other. And so that's to say that uh, the, the type of trends or the type of noise that you would see in your, in your train data tends to be the, the same one that you would see in your test data. Um, now that's not always the case. Uh, for, for many of the reasons that we talked about in, in the, the prior lecture. Um, and, and we should be uh, especially careful if we are uh, looking at, at any of these where our train and test uh, uh, splits are, uh, for example, from different subsets of our population. Um, if we're, uh, we're doing a, a stratified sample, we shouldn't use one strata for our train set and a, a different one for our test set. Um, we, should, we should always use a, a simple random sample. Um, and, and similarly with, with time series, it's, uh, it's 
uh, certainly easy to think about training a model on uh, historical data and then testing it on future data. Um, and, uh, and oftentimes uh, there, there will be changes over time that mean that, that your test data is now not like your, uh, your past training data, uh, which is what makes it so hard to predict uh, so many time series. Um, and and, um, and and is a, a, a reason why why that's such a hard thing to do. Um, so uh, again, this is to say uh, that the data that is out of the distribution or out of the sample um, uh, may not be uh, may not necessarily uh, be fit well by your model. Uh, so again, uh, noting the, uh, the the biases and the limitations of our model, um, one of them is that uh, that we've only known that we've captured uh, captured um, uh, the the trends well in our training data, um, and, and we'll we'll go into a little bit more depth uh, in in the future about what exactly uh, we we mean by by capturing the trends well. But but for now, to say that, that we have a, a low loss on our um, on our uh, our training data. Uh, so to, to sum this up, um, we, we've looked at uh, a few different types of, of models, um, uh, especially simple constant or, or linear models. Um, we've, uh, we've noted uh, the, the notation um, for, for how we describe the models and, and also uh, our, our input features. Um, and talked about different loss functions um, that uh, that are, are ways that we can measure the error in the performance of our models. Um, we, we didn't talk so much about the, uh, the, the different ways that we, we fit our models towards those loss functions, um, but we did uh, talk about um, overfitting and generalization and uh, how we would uh, potentially use the, uh, the, the error or loss values in these different splits um, to, to measure how well that fitting, uh, that fitting had, had gone um, and, and how well we expect uh, to have a, a general model um, that can generalize to, to held out data or not. Uh, that's, uh, that's all we have for today. Uh, another uh, lecture on the, the little bit of the longer side, um, but, uh, but hopefully all of this content was, uh, was pretty simple and, and easy to digest. Um, and uh, I, I'm excited to dig into uh, more complex models uh, moving forward. We'll, uh, we'll take a, a little break to uh, try and, and get in some of the other topics introduced before, uh, before your project pitches are due. Um, but I, I'm excited to, to get back to modeling uh, in, in a little bit here. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for uh, watching. And I'll uh, see you online.